Um, all right, so I was asked to do a recap of what we did yesterday in this very room, and it looks like about half the people are, were there yesterday. <laughs> so um, <coughs> they can interrupt me and tell me if I'm summarizing this wrong. I did not have a lot of time to prepare this, so the slides are not very polished. And I have no idea how long this is going to take. Um, and, but do, please do feel free to interrupt me if there are any questions. I, uh, yeah, I've, been, I've tried to summarize some of the discussions and try to give some background to some of the topics since if you get a bunch of Wi-Fi people in the room, they will talk about Wi-Fi based on their previous knowledge and they will not explain <laughs> to everyone else what they're talking about. So uh, I've tried to add some explanations here, but it, since I know all those things, they may not be sufficient. So please do feel free to interrupt me and ask for clarification where necessary. Um, so yesterday we had a, a full day here of a workshop with a, a bunch of people in the room to discuss what's going on in wireless and what we're working on, what the next topics are going to, or what the next work is going to be, what the new standards are and all those things. Um, so uh, I just start and this is basically in sort of random slash chronological order. Um, the, we started off the morning with a, a discussion about how we best merge new wireless drivers, um, how the, the, in particular, the real tech situation is, and in particular, how we can merge the new Marvell drivers. Um, I would like to thank Realtek and Marvell for sending people here to, uh, to discuss these issues because that's very helpful for, for us as upstream maintainers, etc., to talk to the people and uh, get their view on things and understand what they are, what, 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 where they are coming from, what their pain points are, etc. I think we had a frank and good discussion on, on these things, and I'm hoping they will all be submitting drivers soon. So we'll see what happens. This was a relatively long discussion. We discussed a bunch of things um, about workflow issues and review issues and th things like that. That would be familiar to most people who are working upstream. So I'm not going to reiterate that. I will just say that um, I, th I think it was very good that we had Realtek and Marvell both here, rep represented here. And uh, hopefully we'll have, we'll have some solutions to their, their drivers in, in, the, in the near to medium future. Uh, and then we sort of started diving into all the th kinds of issues we're talking about. Yoni spoke about the enforcement, upcoming enforcement of radio parameters and firmware. That's not really new to many of us, it's just new to their particular chipset. So um, that's something that will happen that the regulatory bodies are, are pushing for so that even in an open source driver, the, the users can't just go modify the code and make the radio do something that's not permitted by regulatory. Th th there are problems with this, enforcing this, because you can't really know where, you're, where you are if you're, like, if you're in the Wi-Fi NIC, basically firmware running in the Wi-Fi NIC, it's really hard to figure out where in the world you are at, the, at a certain point in time. So there are complications with this, but it is going to happen, um, and we can't do anything against it. The, another topic that comes up here is that uh, Etsy, the European uh, regulatory body essentially, is starting to limit in order to gain LTEU compatibility on the 5 gigahertz band. So LTE is pushing into more spectrum because everyone wants more spectrum. And if they can get it for free, hey, even better. Um, so LTE is pushing into 5 gigahertz spectrum that Wi-Fi is currently pretty much using by itself. So um, in order to have interoperability, the, uh, the standards, or the, yeah, so Etsy is the standards body in a sense, but the reg regulatory uh, agencies are going to require certain medium access parameters, certain ways of accessing the medium so that the two can co coordinate in a sense. Um, and then this, in, in terms of Wi-Fi, this limits the EDCA parameters, which is the, which are the parameters that are used to determine how medium access is done, how long you back off listening 
before transmitting, um, if there's a collision, how long you back off after that, how long you can use the channel f at most for a given period of time. So uh, these parameters are going to be limited and there's going to be need, we, we're going to have to do some work to implement that in Linux. Um, people are working on it, so it's not really something th that's just sort of a discussion. It, it was also a bit of an FYI, this is coming and we'll, we'll have to implement it. Another uh, thing with the regulatory that we talked about or that I presented essentially was that uh, we recently merged a new framework into into uh, the wireless stack to load the entire regulatory database. I don't know if you've run Linux on a laptop, you've perhaps seen the whole CRDA and, and all those things that it loads a new country when you uh, boot up your system, it, it loads data from in a very roundabout way using the CRDA tool. Um, that we're getting rid of essentially and loading the whole database into the kernel because it can be presented in a roughly 3.5 kilobyte blob. So it's not very big. Um, so loading it into the kernel in a new extensible format makes a lot of sense um, because it gives us a lot more flexibility than having to update the, the, the user space tools all the time and uh, having to the, the current format is, was also not extensible, so there, there were problems there. But rather than making the current format extensible and updating all the user space tools and updating all the APIs and everything, we just decided to just load the whole thing into the kernel, which makes a lot of things a lot easier. So this three or three? Not three. Um, <laughs> it's in the tree now. I, it's in next now. So I'm, whatever the next version is, it will be in um, 4.15, I guess. And then... Um, yeah, and then we haven't even released a binary yet, so <laughs> it will take some time to sort out all these issues, but we have all the infrastructure in place and we've already done, I've already built in one extension in a sense to prove that the extensible format works. So um, that I think is, gives us also a way forward with the whole Etsy parameters that we need to represent in some way and, and that will help. Uh, yes, the it, yeah, we can't break user land, right? So we still s do support CRDA. Um, I'm hoping it will go away over some time because people will have will want and have to migrate to new databases that represent more uh, data that we need. But um, for for now, CRDA is still supported and will be supported for the foreseeable future. If you don't have the database file, then it will invoke CRDA. But if you do have it, then it will basically just say, all right, I got all the information I need. I'm, I'm not going to have to invoke CRDA. So that um, makes a lot of things simpler because you don't have to go through the whole U event and everything to, to get this, uh, to, to get to the data. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I tried to mention that. Um, yeah, and then versus we not actually the we make it the, the whatever the data is more extensible, more accessible, even for the user spaces as well. Well, we always need to represent the the data in both ways because right. even if we enforce things in the device, we still need to expose the parameters that should be used. Sometimes we we s we just know in the device that we need to enforce something, so we need to take the parameters from somewhere. Sometimes you want your laptop is, I don't know, maybe your laptop was built in the EU, but you're mo you've moved to, to the US and you don't want to be breaking the US rules, so you need some sort of higher level enforcement because your laptop may think it's a European model and just apply European rules. So you can apply more restrictive rules also using this uh, database, right? You can say, all right, I really, my, my laptop allows me to do channel 12 and 13 because it was built in Europe, but I, I'm in the US right now, I really don't want to um, use channel 12 and 13 so nobody comes knocking to my door. So I, I you know, it's a stretch, but still. So, so you can use it. Um, and there, there are some things that you just, you know, maybe you, you've represented your transmit power and your really important radio parameters in the firmware, like radar detection. But um, other things, you know, which sub-channels have which certain further limits or things like that, maybe you haven't represented. So there's still value in having this data 
And uh, I think generally there's also still value in having this data collected in some way um, in, a, in a format that we can access. So another thing, um, yeah, this is just sort of a whole list of things, right? So there's no particular order to it, uh, et cetera. So another thing that's been going on for, I don't know, I would argue a few years. Uh, since Civi, okay, so that's a year and a half or something like that. Um, we've had, we've, we've been discussing um, that we want to do the frame format. So wireless has a different frame format over the air for obvious reasons. And we need to be able to transform that into the Ethernet format because that's the data plane format that we expose to the kernel. So there, there is hardware now, or there has been hardware for quite a while that can do this conversion in hardware. And we need to be able to support that. So there was uh, some discussion, ongoing discussions around how we can support that. And uh, it has some complexities, especially around monitor mode and encapsulating the frames in radio tap because that in currently assumes that you have 802.11 format. And we discussed a little bit what we can do there. Um, it looks like we'll prob probably just have to break it to some extent to be able to represent 802.3 frames because that's we really want to be able to uh, represent everything that we get from the device there in order to aid debugging. Um, it was also blocking this uh, filter thing I will talk about on the next slide, but I think we hashed out a solution to that um, over the last couple of weeks. So the, the filter thing, um, there, there's, this comes up every now and then. People want to in introspect what's happening on Wi-Fi, and they want to see management frames, they want to keep statistics, uh, things like that. So they post patches. And I keep rejecting the patches, saying this you shouldn't be using, uh, you shouldn't be adding special patches for your special infrastructure needs or for your special introspection needs, because we have to maintain that code forever, essentially. Um, and I keep saying you should be using monitor interfaces because you see everything, but the problem is uh, that then you can add a socket filter and you don't see the frames that you don't care about, you only see the frames that you want, but. Um, even just doing the SKB copy is too expensive. So w in order to send a frame to the monitor, because we have to modify the frame later to do header conversions and things like that, we um, have to do an SKB copy. And that's really expensive, especially if you just throw away the frame in the socket filter later. So the solution we've been, we've been talking about for a while is to add an eBPF filter before that copy so that um, you can essentially have a filter that decides whether or not to do the copy and whether or not you want to see that frame. You could even just discard the frame and do your statistics right in that eBPF filter using BP, EB, uh, BPF maps or, or things like that, depending on what your needs are. So this would be attached to a monitor interface. Um, so I, I have patches for this. I just need to do some introspection work, uh, like add BPF introspection to them and do a little bit of work to do the uh, whole frame format issue uh, or solve that whole frame format issues, issue so you can determine whether it's uh, a .11 or a .3 frame. So that, that, should be, uh, that should sort of solve that problem of everyone wanting to add their own special code to get certain frames out of the system to, to see what's going on or sometimes to debug it, sometimes to, to just uh, do some statistics, sometimes to do special protocols on top um, etc. So there, there's some, some, there's certainly a need for the, for something like this and we don't, I don't, I don't want to add a uh, code for all of these things. Another thing we talked about uh, for some time was the internal TXQs in Mac 8.2.11. It's a mechanism that um, allows a whole bunch of things. We essentially started bypassing the queue disks and we want to convert to all of the to to this infrastructure for all the drivers, but I'm not going to go into this because Toke will explain it in his talk at 1 p.m. So if you are interested, you should just listen to his talk instead, and he will spend a lot more time than I have now to go into the details and what's going on there, and what uh, are the next things that are happening. Um, one of the next big things coming in the standards is the HE, the high efficiency standard, 802.11 AX. Um, it 
basically the next file standard that's relevant to to the to us as what we're doing in, in 2.45 gigahertz bands for for the regular Wi-Fi chips that you have in the laptops. Um, it's takes some tricks from LTE with respect to spectrum efficiency. So it, it has, well, it, it takes some modulation tricks from LTE. It takes, uh, it allows higher and even smaller bandwidth than you have today in order to cram more people in. One of the use cases would be to have like a whole stadium full of people all using Wi-Fi and getting that to a higher level of effic efficiency than you can get to with today's Wi-Fi. Um, and, and there are, as usual for a new FI standard, there are a lot of things to do. We want to be able to sniff this, so we need radio tap definitions. There are new management frames, new management elements inside those frames. And uh, in particular, one of the things that we also discussed was that it appears to require multi-BSSID support, although I haven't found the language in the spec yet. It's there somewhere, I know. <laughs> um, it, 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 there's a lot of language in the spec where it will say, all right, you, you have to do multi-BS, or you can do, if you're an HE file, you, you can do multi-BS SSD support without all the other measurement stuff that usually implies. So that's a bunch of changes there, but um, I, yeah, I, I didn't, there's a typo here. It should be 802.11 AX for obvious reasons, but um, yeah, so, so that requires multi-BSSID support, which we also talked about today. Each BSSID is sending beacons, and um, that's not necessarily the best thing to do if you have one air access point that's, you know, so let's say even in your house, you might have an access point that has your home network, your carrier's network presented, like here, all those networks. You also see the Olay Wi-Fi um, that you have to pay to use. And that's the same access point implementing that. So that's the second network. In my house, I also have a guest network that people can use the internet, but they can't really get to any of my devices. So um, usually you can have a whole bunch of networks. In the enterprise, it's worse because you have multiple networks. Maybe you have one for your phones, one for certain classes of devices, one for guests, one for the employees' personal devices that are not supposed to be on the company network, but you want to provide them Wi-Fi for their phones, and you don't want them to be using guest networks. So, so you can have a lot of uh, networks on the same access points, and today each one of those is sending beacons, and um, with the multi-BSS ID that more or less goes away, it, it changes that. Um, but we need to do client updates, and these client updates are needed in Linux. We need to be able to uh, understand what, what, these, what the different BSS IDs are for a single beacon and how to parse them, etc. So um, we have some code to do that, and we spent some time discussing what we need to do there and, and what the current work is that's ongoing. Um, another thing was the simultaneous authentication of equals. So we have support for this now. It's basically a replacement for the PSK that you use with personal networks. It's a more secure implementation of that. It uses elliptic curve in the handshake. But if you have a phone that's offloading the authentication handshake to the Wi-Fi NIC, to the chip itself, then you may not want to implement the whole elliptic curve or not all of the curves in the Wi-Fi wi chip. So we're, we discussed some ways of offloading that, or, well, not really offloading, but of putting that back on the host given how those chips work. And um, the Authentication handshake can be offloaded when you use the connect command, or is offloaded when you use the connect command, but you want the curve to be back on the host. So we discussed a, a few potential solutions for that. I'm not sure we've really, or I, I, yeah, we haven't really agreed. We need to do some more research on what's really uh, necessary and how we can solve this. Another thing um, I actually brought up is the NAN and the NAN data path. So NAN is uh, neighbor, I don't know, there's a bunch of terms, neighbor awareness networking, neighbor aware network, networking, uh, something like that. It provides device to device discovery in a supposedly energy efficient manner. Uh, someone said it, it was the apology for P2P. <laughs> um, P2P is the, the Wi-Fi direct standard, the technical term. 
and uh, you may have been using it on your phones or you may have support on your phones. You may even have support for NAN on your phones. It's also intended to work well in a crowded environment. So when you're downstairs, you can still use it rather than not being able to use Wi-Fi because everyone is. And uh, there are extensions under work for, for data transfer. I even found some code out there today. Um, and uh, there's a link here for, for what the Wi-Fi lines has to say about this. Uh, so we are working on, I work for Intel, and we're working on uh, the pro a protocol implementation of this in WPA supplicant so that we can have, we can um, sort of have this in Linux in an easier way. It will need device support because there's a lot of scheduling and uh, timing restrictions, and you, you can be on different channels at the same time and things like that. Um, and, but we will also likely add some support to hardware sim, which is the hardware simulator that uses Mac ID211 so that we can uh, test the whole thing in a high level without having to whole, have a whole lab set up that, that has all the different devices that you may want to use. Um, so, so there's some, this is ongoing work. We have some code, we haven't released it. Um, and we, I, here we just really wanted to discuss the architecture if that makes sense. And so this is probably what we're going to do. So the, the remaining slides I have is just a whole bunch of miscellaneous topics. Uh, we discussed yet again, as we've discu been discussing in the last few years, that we want to do uh, the ePoll, the authentication frames. So the authentication frames in Wi-Fi, there's the 1x handshake that uses them, and there's the four-way handshake that uses them. And currently, they are going through the data path, which has implications on Linux and on how this works, there's been a regression for years in the bridging code um, that broke this in, in some configurations or you have to configure it in a really special way. That's the biggest pain point right now. There are also extensions that you may or may not need to encrypt these frames or you may have certain requirements on these frames that we can't express when they're transmitted as data frames and then the Wi-Fi stack doesn't really uh, there's no re really no way to transmit them as data frames and have the Wi-Fi stack act specially on them. So we want to use them because they're really control frames in a sense. They're not actual data frames. Uh, we want to uh, use them, embed them in the Wi-Fi configuration API instead. And um, yeah, so right now the status of that is that no one really knows what's going on. Someone promised they would work on it but didn't show up. Uh, so I don't know what, what there, what's happening there, but it's definitely something that we're going to be doing. We discussed the Netlink Extended Act support, <coughs> which basically allows you to give more, uh, give error strings with error messages. So in anything that's Netlink, you, have, you always have the problem that if you return E and Val, it's really hard to figure out what that meant. So we'll be, we will likely add a bunch of strings to, uh, to the Wi-Fi code to help you figure out what was wrong when you send your Wi-Fi command. Um, so that's just sort of, we have the infrastructure now and we want to use it. Also with the NAND code that we're working on, we want to use the cookie support so when you return successful and you've created some sort of object, you can return the handle to this object, which, we, which is, uh, they're called the cookie in that, in that case, in Netlink. Um, you can return that, that cookie inside the Netlink act message that comes back when you've done your operation so you don't have the overhead of creating more, uh, more messages there. So, so the question is what about drivers? Um, yeah, in theory we can plumb this through to the drivers. We, have to, we would have to put the Netlink X act pointer somewhere that the driver could use it and access it. Um, or we would have to extend all the operation methods to, to uh, pass the pointer. So in theory, we can plumb this through. I think we've got our hands full just adding it to the stack itself for now. Um, so, you know, plumbing it through to the drivers is, is 
yeah, if we get there to like, you know, 90% in the stack and we think that's great and then we find something where you really can't tell what the driver did and the driver rejected something and, you know, things like that, I think we can think about it at some point. But I think for now we just have our hands full because this is a new mechanism. We have probably hundreds of error codes that we may want to add things to. Um, so, and, and the, the Wi-Fi stack in particular tries to catch a lot of errors beforehand, right? So the drivers would advertise their feature support and the Wi-Fi check would, Wi-Fi stack would check those feature support flags and reject things. So hopefully the drivers don't actually have to return an error too much. Um, yeah, it will happen, but. So, so Kalle is saying ath 10 k usually prints an error message. So yeah, something like that should eventually be converted to uh, extended ACK and, and pass it out to user space because just printing it in the kernel log is fairly much useless. Unless you're debugging and act actively looking at it, no one really, no one really uh, sees it that way, right? All right, where am I? Another thing that was brought up that no one's really, or at least as far as I'm, I know, no one's really thought about before, the, was that um, it would be good to simplify host APD configuration for a sort of fully featured configuration where you just want to use your hardware to the fullest capabilities that it has. In some sense, you may not want to use all of the capabilities by default because they're still under development or something like Greenfield is not something that you want to use for an HT device because you can't really deploy that, but um, it was brought up that it would be good to have some sort of configuration for host APD that you could just take and run on, on the device and host APD would automatically configure itself to a larger set of features that make sense. So for instance, if you run this on a VHT device on five gigahertz, you configure your channel to 36, it would actually try to use 80 megahertz configuration with a very wide bandwidth rather than um, right now it would just use 11a basically so not have any HT or VHT rates until you unless you explicitly configure that so this would be a way to to make that easier for well essentially for everyone who ever has to do this um, so that that's something I, I'm hoping someone will work on I don't have plans myself but um, maybe the people who brought it up will submit a patch to host APD and that seems to be well received. WPA supplicant itself has the ability, so if you're running it in basically in client mode, you can still have a an access point with a certain subset of features um, brought up, and that has some code, so it, it shouldn't actually be very difficult to do this. An another thing we talked about for some time is the A211 mesh, which was A211 S or TGS. Um, this is a Wi-Fi spec to allow meshing of devices, to allow them to transfer frames between themselves and have portals and things like that. Um, it's not really related to any of the Batman and all these types of mesh things uh, people are doing over 802.11 ad hoc networks, but uh, this is the real mesh um, that's defined in the spec. and. Um, my concern there was that I, I don't see a lot of people working on it upstream and I don't know that much about it. But we do know that there are people using it so we, we spend some time discussing who may, who may is or may be using it and uh, what the, if there are any problems with it, etc. And it seems that it's working pretty well. We know that Google is using it. They presented on it last year. So um, maybe someone needs to take them some time to look if they have any interesting patches there, but um, it looks like it's just kind of working, so that's perhaps why no one's touching it. And there was only some very recent, there were some relatively recent patches to add VHT support, so even that seems to be working now. So in general, I guess my concern is a little unnecessary in a sense. Um, if it's just working, then maybe we don't need to do anything there. Um, another thing we've been discussing for a long, long time is FTM. This is the fine timing measurement that allows you to do implement location services using Wi-Fi. It's essentially a way to uh, just measure how far your access point is away using the, f the flight time of your Wi-Fi packets. 
So you have to divide by the speed of light and, or do calculations with your time and the speed of light, but um, that, that gives you pretty accur accurate location, but we don't have any APIs for it upstream right now, and everyone is sort of implementing their own vendor-specific thing. We had a draft of APIs, but they're not very good coming from my group at Intel, and we have been working on getting those um, polished, but it's been a very long process because it already works for the people who care, the customers, so getting it upstream is uh, just very difficult, or getting time to work on it is difficult. But um, we hope to be doing that. So that's just something that hopefully will eventually converge in some sense and it will just sort of work out of the box. You still need some higher level uh, algorithms and things like that because if you just have the raw measurements, you can't really say where, where you are. And obviously, you need a database of where the access points are that you're measuring against and uh, all of those things. But hopefully, the low level stuff we can sort of uh, sort out and have some common way, at least have the ability to have common APIs for it. And then vendors or OEMs who want to use it can push their Wi-Fi vendors to, to implement that if necessary. And one short topic was the VHT extended NSS support. So when the first 160 megahertz access points were uh, developed, it turned out that when you go to 160 megahertz, some Wi-Fi devices have problems still supporting the largest number of streams. So typically, your access point may have something like four antennas and support four spa spatial streams. But if uh, on 80 megahertz for the currently deployed 11 AC devices, but if you go to 160 megahertz on those devices, um, you suddenly can only support two antennas or two streams, two spatial streams. Because I don't know, I don't actually know why I'm, I'm yeah, there's just some, some reason for that. And uh, for some devices, some devices can do the full thing, some devices can't. So the, the spec was amended to allow that sort of configuration to be uh, conveyed to the client so it can understand if it's using 80 megahertz transmission, transmissions, it's okay to transmit with four spatial streams. But if it's using 160 megahertz transmissions, it's not okay, and it has to use two spatial streams only. So um, as a result of how this was implemented, a client that doesn't implement the support for it will understand that it should use two streams only for all bandwidths, which is not really what you want. So, um, or actually, no, it's the other way around. It can use four streams, but not 160 megahertz, I think. Yeah, that's, that's the way. It's that way around. But. Um, so I have some code to uh, to implement this, but we've I've had a hard time figuring out um, which access points actually have this problem and how to test against them. So we d discussed that for some time, and we hopefully have some people who can do some testing there and uh, report back whether my implementation is actually correct so we can merge it and uh, get rid of that sort of negotiation problem where we don't discover the full capabilities. So I think that was about it. Um, that we, what we discussed yesterday. Obviously, it took a lot longer than summarizing it. Um, we spent almost the entire day. Um, and yeah, if there are any questions, comments, feel, feel free to ask. I, I will pass the mic around. Or if anyone who was there yesterday thinks I forgot something important, feel free to mention it now. No questions, no comments. All right. Thanks, everyone.